Marx, Women in Capitalist Social Reproduction by uh, Martha E. Jimenez. Chapter 1, Marxism and Feminism. Feminism is the struggle against sexism or discriminatory social practices and ideologies that result in male supremacy and female oppression. Sexism as a form of social oppression is not a modern phenomenon. Paraphrasing Marx and Engels, it can be stated that the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles and sex struggles, because the existence of class or the existence of classes presupposes private ownership of the means of production, monogamy, and therefore sexism. The presence of sexism throughout history accounts for the ease with which it has been taken for granted as a universal feature of all societies or as the product of innate differences between the sexes. This also explains why women today search for its historical origins in an effort to understand its present manifestations. Within the social sciences, the conceptualization of sexism depends upon the basic assumptions about human nature, society, and the relationship which underlie current theories about society and social behavior. Theories vary in the emphasis given to either human nature or society. If priority is given to human nature, persons are considered to have inherent traits such as selfishness, competitiveness, and utilitarianism. Social relations and institutions are viewed, consequently, as products of those individual traits. In this context, men and women are considered to have innate traits that make them different from each other. For example, while males are aggressive, strong, instrumental, etc., females are weak, submissive, effective, nurturant, etc. Sex differences in power and in social participation are conceptualized as consequences of these inherent differences between the sexes. When the emphasis is placed upon society, persons are viewed as empty slates, the product of the socialization process which integrates them into a powerful and coercive social reality. Sexism emerges within this context as a product of social organization. Men and women are different and have different powers and social participation because they are socialized differently. Socialization patterns are then explained in terms of social needs and our processes of functional differentiation and division of labor. From a Marxist standpoint, the social sciences present competing idealist and materialist explanations of sexism, which do, which do not preclude their combination and explanations which take into account both individual and social factors. Marxism transcends the, the dichotomy between innate and acquired traits and posits instead the notion that man is the ensemble of social relations. This notion is the basis of the Marxist theory of human nature, which negates the notion of an isolated human nature and affirms the inextricable unity between persons and their natural and social environments. Marxism postulates that neither persons nor their natural and social environment can be viewed in isolation as things in themselves which interact with one another or which are the cause or the effect of the other. The theoretical focus shifts from the abstractions of persons in environment, natural and social, to the processes through which persons, nature, and society acquire definite objective forms. These processes, processes are historically specific and can be identified for the purposes of scientific analysis. In this context, the key to understanding sexism rests upon the exploration of its historically specific forms within concrete modes of production. The understanding and conceptualization of sexism today presupposes, therefore, an understanding of its place within the capitalist mode of production. This chapter is a contribution to the development of a Marxist analysis of the capitalist roots of sexism and the implications for changes in the present and future status of women, which such analysis suggests. 
Capitalist Development and Its Effects on Women. As Marx and Engels repeatedly stated throughout their work, capitalism is both a progressive and a regressive force because it contains contradictions. The two fundamental contradictions are a the contradiction between the capitalist class and the working class, which is manifested through the class struggle, and b the contradiction between the development of the productive forces or productive capacity of the capitalist mode of production and the private ownership of the means of production. This contradiction is expressed through chronic unemployment and periodic economic crises. The development of the productive forces means the development of science, technology, and efficient forms of productive organization, which are reflected in the growth of the productivity of labor and the capacity to produce an ever greater amount of goods at lower prices. This progressive aspect of capitalism is counteracted by the private ownership of the means of production. This means that the productive capacity will be harnessed to the interests of the capitalist classes and that it will be maintained within limits that do not threaten the, ma the maintenance of the class structure. Investments are therefore made only when profitable and monopolies and other forms of capitalist power establish price controls so that high prices are artificially maintained. This contradiction is intuitively grasped by people when they ponder, for example, how it is that the United States can send a man to the moon, while healthcare, housing, education, and transportation remain as seemingly unsolvable problems. In addition, this contradiction has consequences that affect women both within and outside the household and set the basis for the maintenance of sexism as an inherent feature of capitalist social reality. Growth in the productivity of labor is reflected in the changes in the number of workers needed in the production process. The greater the technological development and, therefore, the greater the productive capacity, the smaller the number of workers needed. This process, which under different relations of production would result in the growth of free time for human development, results in unemployment and poverty under capitalism. This is why automation, which has the potential of liberating humankind from the realm of necessity and of opening the doors to the realm of freedom, is viewed with dread by the working class, for it signifies within capitalist countries the growth of unemployment and the spread of poverty and increasing competition among workers for the scarce jobs available. How does this process affect women? On the one hand, it has relegated women to a subsidiary component of the labor force. While at the beginning of the process of capitalist development, the whole family was included in the ranks of the labor force. As the forces of production developed and fewer workers were needed, children and women were slowly phased out of the labor force and were kept as a reserve army of labor, ready to be used when needed. E.g. as strike breakers, as sources of cheap labor in those sectors of production where the ratio of workers to machines is high, e.g. the clothing industry, and to do men's work during World War II. On the other hand, this process of excluding women from the, from the labor force was reflected in the consolidation of the family as a separate realm, where domestic labor became the exclusive domain of women. There are, therefore, two consequences of the built-in tendency of capitalism to generate unemployment. One, the relative exclusion of women from the labor force and relegation to lower status, poorly paid jobs, and two, the separation of domestic production from the sphere of socially recognized productive activities and its transformation into the sphere of private interpersonal relationships. It is not argued that women do not generally work outside the home. On the contrary, the participation of women in the labor force has been increasing in advanced capitalist countries, and it tends to rise in times of economic crises. But the overall effect of the fluctuating demand for women's labor and relegation to the lower levels of the occupational structure contributes to a keeping women in their homes as much as possible b using them sporadically when needed c devaluing the full-time participation of women in the labor force and lowering their wage levels it is presumed that women are part of a household headed by a male and as such their wages need not be sufficient 
to support a family independent from a man. D. Obfuscating the economic nature of domestic labor and its economic value to the capitalist class. E. Obfuscating the socially necessary nature of domestic labor and its importance for the country as a whole. And F. Maintaining the subordination of women to men because they control the means of production, capitalist males, and exchange wage earners and salary, or an exchange wage earners and salary earners. These processes operate at the level of the mode of production, the level of unobservable structures and social relations, i.e. the level of capitalist relations of production, class relations, and capitalist contradictions resulting in a dynamic and changing organization of production that splits the productive process between a public or industrial sector and a private or household sector and gives men control over the means of production and exchange. The observable effects of the functioning of the mode of production at the level of sex stratification and sex differentiation within the occupational structure and within the household vary from one country to another, as well as among areas of a given country. Those variations are linked to the stage of capitalist development characterizing a given country, the dominant or sub subordinate place which a given country has, has within the worldwide network of imperialism and the extent of uneven development within the country. Both Marxist and non-Marxist social scientists would agree about the significance of the manifestations of sexism as depicted at the levels of sex differentiation and stratification. While Marxists would explain those processes as the effects of specifically capitalist contradictions, structures, and processes, Social scientists explain them either in terms of social requirements, social processes of functional differentiation, division of labor, or according to inherent differences between the sexes. Such general explanations overlook the capitalist roots of sexism and cannot provide feminists with guidelines for an effective struggle. On the other hand, the social sciences provide excellent documentation of the consequences of capitalist processes from which Marxists and Marxist feminists have a great deal to learn. There is, however, an inherent weakness in an analysis of sexism limited to the levels of sex stratification and differentiation. At those levels, it appears as if all men were equally powerful and all women were equally subject to oppression. On the contrary, men and women who belong to the capitalist class have more economic and social power than working class men and women, although these specific power differential differentials are obscured by the focus upon sex-linked differences that characterize all analyses of sexism if undertaken in isolation from an, from an, an analysis of class structure. This discussion of the position of women within capitalism and the capitalist basis of sexism cannot end without a brief discussion of some of the main contradictions and antagonisms affecting and dividing women. One. The primary contradictions affecting women are the two main capitalist contradictions, both in their national and in their international manifestations. This means that the effect of imperialism upon the capitalist structures, processes, and contradictions within a given country cannot be overlooked in the study of the oppression of women. 2. Sexism Male dominance cuts across class lines and stems from male control over the means of production, exchange and the conditions of phys physical and social reproduction. I, I don't buy that. That's a bad point. Three, contradiction between capitalist women and working class women. Their different relationship to the means of production creates contradictory interests between working class and capitalist women, which are stronger than the common interests that the struggle against sexism may generate. The utopian notion of sisterhood arises precisely in abstraction of irreconcilable class-based differences among women. 4. Antagonism between working class men and working class women. Chronic unemployment generates a constant antagonism between working class men and women. Because of the sex-segregated nature of the labor market, the competition for jobs 
is more acute among women than between men and women. Nevertheless, as women are a reserve army of cheap labor that can be used to displace male workers, this antagonism is an ever-present feature of capitalism. It tends to remain latent in times of economic growth, but is likely to become exacerbated in times of economic crises. Politically, it supports sexism and the capitalist social order for it blocks the development of class solidarity within the working class as a whole. Five, antagonism between middle class and working class women. There are wide income, educational and occupational and lifestyle differences among women that are readily perceived at the level of social stratification and which are mistakenly conceptualized as class differences. Differences in socioeconomic status are found among women who structurally belong to the working class because they and or their husbands make their living mainly or exclusively from the sale of their labor power. The material problems confronted by women from the middle class are different from those of working class women, only in their outward manifestations. There, this is con like, this is bad. Manual workers, white collar workers, professional and career women face different struggles in the context of their work. Also, many middle class women are able to pursue their interests because of paid domestic labor and the labor of low paid administrative and clerical workers. The common structural situation shared by all women workers is obscured by this antagonism that stands in the way of the development of working class solidarity among women workers. The complex relationship between capitalist contradictions, sexism, and the split in the productive process which determines the position of women and the specific contradictions and antagonisms affecting women are the same in all capitalist countries. Their observable manifestations, however, vary from country to country. There is no capitalist country where the working class is not only fragmented along sexual lines, but also along occupational, racial, and ethnic lines. This produces a struggle for survival that pits men against women, status groups against status groups, dominant ethnic groups against ethnic minorities, and the latter against each other and against women, and so on. Sexism together with racism and status distinctions is thus one of the ways in which men and women are oppressed within capitalist countries and become conscious of the class struggle and fight it. This means that awareness of class antagonisms tends to be obscured by the more immediate awareness of interpersonal and intergroup conflicts, which thus contribute to maintaining unchanged the structural source of those conflicts. This statement does not deny the reality or the pain associated with those forms of social oppression. It simply indicates that they all have a common source, which must be taken into consideration at some point if those forms of oppression are to be effectively overcome. The scientific and political relevance of Marxism for feminism. The analysis of the position of women presented above, although incomplete, illustrates the importance of the theoretical contribution of Marxism to the understanding of sexism within capitalism and suggests important avenues of theoretical and empirical inquiry. Perhaps the most important point of the discussion at this level is the identification of the common grounds for Marxist and sociological concerns and of the basis for the critical integration of the sociological analysis of sex differentiation and sex stratification with the Marxist analysis of the specifically capitalist structural and superstructural supports for those processes. The basis for that integration is given by the Marxist argument that the capitalist contradictions and the interests of the capitalist class impose limitations to empirical variations in sex differentiation and sex stratification within uh, capitalist countries. Theoretical and empirical investigation of their historically possible range of variability within a given country at a given time would not only increase the scientific understanding of capitalist processes, but would also provide feminists with a realistic basis for the evaluation of their short and long run political objectives. The relevance of the Marxist analysis of sexism is only scientific 
or is not only scientific, but also political. Marxist theory provides feminists with guidelines for acquiring knowledge of the structured limitations and possibilities available to women at a given stage in the development of the capitalist mode of production. It increases the value of that knowledge as a basis for sound political practice because it stresses the relevance of determining both the historically specific influences exerted upon those possibilities by the superstructure and by national and international circumstances which affect each country in which such analyses are formulated. It provides knowledge of the concrete links between sexism and capitalism, its contradictions, structures, and processes, and it elucidates the inherent limitations of feminism if, as a movement, it remains isolated from the class struggle. From a Marxist perspective, feminists have two options. One, to remain focused purely on improvements in the status of women and carry on an economic, political, and ideological struggle for the rights of women to economic self-sufficiency, full social and political participation, and self-definition in terms of personal achievement. On the basis of the analysis presented above, it can be argued that such a struggle may succeed in achieving changes in the following areas. A. Sex differentiation or division of labor within and outside the household. B. Sex stratification or power differences between the sexes, within and outside the household. Such changes would be concretely manifested in a more egalitarian division of labor within the home, increased participation of women in the labor force in the most challenging and best paid positions, and an increased ability to control their lives actively and effectively. A mere listing of those possibilities indicates that such changes support the interests of the capitalist class. Given that changes at the level market and social relations leave untouched the basic structures of the capitalist mode of production, including sexism, such gains do not imply a change in the position of women as a whole. But on the contrary, the advancement of some women while the, the majority remain at the bottom of the job in pay scales. Although improvements in the status of women are important and the increase in the number of professional and career women may be viewed as a good sign that better times are coming for women, it must not be forgotten that improvements that affect individual women can take place without changes which may improve the position of all women. This means that so long as feminists struggle only for those goals, the advancement of middle-class women will continue to be predicated on the continued exploitation of the majority of women who, through their labor in factories, offices, and other, ho other women's homes, provide the structural support for their sisters' privileged, liberated status. Furthermore, given the constraints which the contradictions of the capitalist mode of production exert upon the size and composition of the labor force, whatever gains middle class and working class women may achieve will be inherently unstable and will be dependent on the fluctuations of the business cycles and on the immediate political interests of the capitalist class. It is therefore of key importance for feminists to keep in mind Marx's warning. Men and women make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances directly encountered, given, and transmitted from the past. The traditions of all the dead generations weigh like a nightmare on the brain of the living. And just when they seem engaged in revolutionizing themselves and things, in creating something that has never yet existed, Precisely in such periods of revolutionary crisis, they anxiously conjure up the spirits of the past to their service and borrow from them names, battle cries, and costumes. To the extent that feminists turn to the past for guidance and search for goddesses and matriarchies, to the extent that feminists seek to play again the struggles for civil, political, and economic rights and raise the banner of equality, to that extent, women will simply gain entrance to the deceptive life of the political community in which their social, political, and economic equality implies also their full membership in capitalist society. They will be active as private individuals. They will use others as means to their own ends and reduce themselves to the role of playthings of powers outside themselves. To the abolition of privileges associated with birth, property, status, religion, and race, Feminism would add the suppression of privileges based on male supremacy. 
as the abolu- as the abolition of the privileges associated with property does not abol- abolish property, as the black experience shows that the abolition of the privileges associated with white supremacy does not abolish racism, women will wor- will learn through long and arduous struggles that the abolition of the privileges associated with male supremacy does not abolish sexism. Two. The second option is to link the feminist struggle to the struggle of the working class. Theoretically, it means that the problems and goals of women should not be analyzed in isolation from the contradictions, structures, and processes of the capitalist mode of production. Practically, it means using the theoretical insights and research findings of Marxism as tools to further the understanding of sexism. Feminists must rethink, in the light of Marxist theory, the many problems, setbacks, and successes which arise in the course of women's individual and collective struggle for existence, selfhood, and self-determination. It is in this context that the crucial problem of the relationship between professional and non-professional women arises. While professional women and middle-class women in general run the risk of becoming isolated from the needs, concerns, and consciousness of working class and non-professional women, the latter run the risk of falling into an anti-intellectualism that contributes to their oppression because it stands in the way of their attaining a clear analysis of their situation. Pursuing endless theoretical refinements that are never translated into dialogue and practical action is as ineffective as engaging in endless talks about personal problems and feelings without ever looking at them as social problems. These problems are social, not only in the sense of being shared by many women, but more importantly, because they are socially determined and are the product of concrete and historically specific class, legal, and political relations and forms of consciousness. Consciousness raising should mean, therefore, moving from the personal level where women's position in capitalist society is analyzed in terms of individual, social, economic, political, and sexual problems associated with femaleness to class consciousness, where those specific, painful, concrete forms of personal oppression are linked to their roots in the common fate of women, who, like male wage and salary earners, own nothing but their labor power and depend on its sale in order to support themselves and their families. Feminist consciousness is, therefore, a double-edged weapon, in itself isolated from the analysis of the broader capitalist forces that buttress sexism, it can only formulate limited goals and guide struggles likely to attain reforms of limited impact upon the liberation of all women. On the other hand, if linked to the analysis of capitalism, it can provide a key step in the process of the development of working class consciousness and the struggle for the liberation of both men and women. Because this work has been focused upon women's problems, interests, and goals, nothing has been said about men except that, structurally, they are more powerful than women. It is nevertheless obvious that women cannot achieve liberation independently from men. This means that the position of women in the mode of production cannot be radically changed without... For fuck's sakes. Radically changed without concomitant and equally radical changes in the position of men. As long as liberation is narrowly defined in terms of socio-economic equality with men within the present conditions, such liberation does not preclude the continued struggle against sexism within and outside the household, and it is nothing but an illusion that ensures the continued social oppression and economic exploitation of both men and women. Because sexism cuts across classes, it obscures the real powerlessness of working class men and misleads working women into believing that all men are the enemy and that all women are potential allies. Under capitalist conditions, both men and women work under conditions of alienated labor. This means that workers develop their talents and skills because of their market value, rather than as an expression of creativity. They have no control over the labor process and its product, and they are placed in constant competition with each other. An important way in which alienated labor is made bearable is through sexism and sexist ideologies that give men the illusion of power and superiority over women, and which give women the dubious power of sexual surrender. 
There are other forces for divisiveness, such as religion, bigotry, racism, and consumerism. The power sexism confers upon working class men, although real and concrete in its painful consequences for women and in the material advantages it may bring to men, is also, like all powers that capitalism bestows upon the oppressed, an illusion that lasts as long as the system can profitably provide men with the economic means to control women. To overlook the fact that sexism dehumanizes and contributes to the exploitation of both men and women leads to the isolation of the feminist struggle from the class struggle and the adoption of limited goals which may lead to the liberation of some women in the short run and which may further the oppression of all in the long run. Conclusion The two options discussed above are historical ones whose significance can best be understood in the context of the development of feminist consciousness and feminist struggle within a given country at a given time. The development of feminist consciousness through the analysis of visible relationships and the possibility of changing those relations is an important step in the development of class consciousness. The limitations of that, re that reformist approach can be learned in the course of struggling for those goals and the assessment at the same time of the present struggles in terms of both theory and of the lessons from the past. This activity presupposes the full development of the scientific contribution of Marxism and also requires going beyond the widespread antagonism towards rigorous intellectual practice on the grounds of its male nature. Scientific analysis is necessary because, as members of capitalist society, women do become aware of their subordinate position in terms of experience and observable relationships, who does what within the home, who learns what at school, what kinds of work they can obtain, and how much they are paid, how their status depends on the status of their fathers and husbands, how men have more power to initiate and terminate relationships, how they find themselves always apologizing, temporizing, smoothing situations, smiling away their powerlessness. The conceptualization of phenomena everyone knows and has experienced in terms of sex stratification and sex differentiation, as well as the specif specification of their links to the capitalist mode of production, is more than an academic game. It is necessary to help women differentiate between those levels of social reality which they know because they consciously and painfully live through them, and those levels which, although perceived with the help of scientific analysis, are nevertheless as real as the others. A realization of the differences between those levels as well as their interconnections leads to an understanding of the reason why, even though changes in the division of labor within and outside the home may take place, women find through their daily experience that sexism remains unchanged. Sexism, in other words, persists despite changes in occupations, division of labor in the home, salary improvements, and access to managerial positions. To be aware of capitalist contradictions, structures, and processes as aspects of social rea reality that remain indifferent to such changes is therefore important not only scientifically, but also at the level of personal and collective awareness. It thus becomes possible for women to understand why Although they may follow what appears to be the rules of the game to liberate themselves, the struggle is nonetheless permanent, a ceaseless combat against sexism within and outside themselves. In the absence of a rigorous analysis of the social forces and relations that remain unchanged, despite changes in women's education, employment, and income, it is easy to turn inward and return to self-recrimination and blame. Feminism, isolated from theoretical and practical links to the class struggle, eventually will lead middle-class women back to the psychiatrist's couch or to some form of collective therapy. More importantly, it will unwittingly contribute to division and political paralysis within the working class movement and will further the maintenance of the oppression and economic exploitation of working class women. The move from a purely feminist consciousness to class consciousness is a long and complex process, likely to vary from country to country according to its historically specific circumstances and to its place within the world capitalist network. This process does not imply the replacement of feminist consciousness by class consciousness, 
but the transcendence of that dichotomy into a class consciousness that embraces not only awareness of economic exploitation, but also sexual oppression and the other forms of social oppression, which may be prevalent in a given country. It is a class consciousness which views concern with sexual, ethnic, cultural, and racial oppression, not as a manifestation of false consciousness, but as a first step in understanding the many faces of exploitation and as the formulation of concrete goals without which the notion of liberation loses meaning. From a Marxist standpoint, the feminist struggle for women's equality should be linked to the working class struggle for liberation, which is the struggle for the material conditions that will render possible the actual practice of equality.